Just ahead on American Black Journal, the Detroit Blight Authority is clearing trash and demolishing vacant structures in the city. We'll talk about the organization's recent cleanup blitz in the Brightmore neighborhood. Plus, some local African American leaders head back to school to inspire students. We'll talk with two of Detroit's history makers. That's all coming up next. Eric wants to know, what does DTE Energy do to make Michigan a better place? Rodney can tell you. We do a lot, like youth education and employment programs. We fund over 500 jobs for youth all across the state. Many are neighborhood improvement projects just like this. It's incredible. Wow, that is fantastic. So this is like a paint by number, this whole thing, right? Communities are such great places, aren't they? They sure are. I love the siding. Measure once, cut twice, right? DTE Energy. Know your own power. When I grow up, when I grow up, when I grow up, I want to be an architectural engineer. A registered nurse. In the law enforcement. A computer scientist. A successful person. Give Michigan's children the chance to aim high with quality early education. Welcome to American Black Journal, I'm Stephen Henderson. The nonprofit Detroit Blight Authority wants to improve the quality of life for Detroiters by cleaning up trash and knocking down vacant structures. The authority was founded by Bill Pulte of Pulte Capital Partners and recently took on its largest project to date, cleanup of the Brightmore community. Residents there have long complained about illegal dumping in their neighborhood. The cleanup initiative covered a 14 block area with about 70 vacant structures. The Detroit Blight Authority's pilot project in partnership with Mayor Dave Bing's office took place earlier this year near Eastern Market. A 10 block area surrounding Detroit Edison Public School Academy was cleared in just 10 days. Joining me now are Brian Farkas, who's the executive director of the Detroit Blight Authority, and Kirk Mays, who's the executive director of the Brightmore Alliance. Welcome to American Black Journal. Thank you. So Blight, that's the, that's the story in Detroit, right? I mean, that yes. is, uh, ask anyone in the city what the two biggest problems are. They will say crime and they will say Blight, and of course the two are are, are very linked. You guys have come up with, I think, what you think is a very innovative and different way to deal with it. Tell me how, how that works. We treat the neighborhood as a whole. So rather than going in and, and hitting one house there and one house in another area, we look at a certain area and say, how do we eliminate blight in the certain geographic area? And it's not just the structures. We've noticed there's a lot to do with the illegal dumping, the overgrown brush. Right. So, so in uh, let's talk about the Easter Market uh, area that you guys did, which is not too far from from my house. I so I saw you guys do it, uh, and I've and I remember what it was like before, and now I see what it's like after. You cleared not just the houses, and there actually weren't that many structures still standing uh, in that area, but you cleared the brush and the the you know there's just the junk that's all over uh, these properties and for a long time it was just flat. I mean it, it yes. really just uh, was uh, just sort of vacant uh, bare land that somebody else could come in and maybe imagine building can, something else. You can see the future. Yeah. And, and by uh, focusing on the, the brush and the overgrown trees and the illegal dumping it kind of symbolizes our planning for this whole process. We learn from the ground up. Right. We learn we actually walk the grounds what's needed to make this beautiful, what's needed to move the needle. And in the Brightmore project, uh, we took that to another degree by actually talking to and listening to the residents. You know, Kirk Mays and his group actually picked out the area we went into. Um, and then we had to hire local laborers, and so Kirk Mays' group helped us hire 28 local residents. Um, and it really signified the buy-in we had from the community. It was outstanding. Now, are you guys, I mean, one of the, one of the big issues with blight uh, in the city is the cost of taking down houses, which I think is somewhere between eight and $10,000. Yes. You guys believe that, that you can do that cheaper, right? Absolutely. And uh, when we say the cost, a lot of people kind of say, how is that possible? Uh, we were founded by the Pulte family right. uh, that, that made their money and, and made a huge imprint in America by bringing construction costs to scale and building high quality homes at a very low cost. Um, you know, building a house is a lot more complicated than tearing than one tearing down. it down, sure. And uh, the mobilization cost involved with bringing the equipment out to the area, having the workers there. If someone's on the piece of equipment, they should be tearing a house down, not driving around the city. And so by clustering all the work, from the utility disconnects to the asbestos uh, to the actual knockdown and haul out, by clustering in a geographic area, you bring the cost down and you increase the You impact. bring down the cost per house, right? Absolutely. Right. Uh, Kirk, uh, Brightmore is a place that 
that when I say blight is an issue in the city, it's a super issue in in in, in Brightmore. So now you've got this this 14 block area that's uh, that's clear. W what's the difference uh, for that community? Well, there's a tremendous. Uh, difference in the physical space. Uh, you can just feel the change of the folks who are living in that that actual area. Um, you can tell that they, they're coming outside more. Uh, more kids are actually choosing to walk that area on their route to whether it's school or to the playground. Um, parents are, are deciding to actually change the school where their children are going to school because now they feel comfortable with their children walking to school. Right. I mean, um, a big part of, of feeling safe is a perception that you are safe. And this tremendously, does a tremendous, um, has a tremendous impact right. on changing people's perception of, of the area of feeling and looking safe. Yeah, so so where in Brightmore uh, is, the, is this 14 block area? It's really right in the middle of okay. the neighborhood. If you look at the map, it's at, um, it's uh, near, really, between uh, Trinity, which is close to Burt Road. It's okay. a street, one street off of Burt Road uh, going west. From Trinity to Outer Drive, at this area in the city is one of those places where Outer Drive actually does one of those funny where turns. It's right. a 90 degree turn. Um, so there, the, the boundary actually has two sides with Outer Drive. So okay. Linden is the, 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 the southern border. Outer Drive is a northern border. Trinity is an eastern border, and then Outer and Drive, Drive again. again. Okay. It's, a, it's about it's close to 100 acres. Okay. And and is this a, a, a part of the neighborhood that has uh, anchor institutions in it that are benefiting from this? Is it a place with businesses, or is it mostly just uh, yeah, residential? It's a few blocks away from Brightmore Community Center. Okay. Um, Gomper School. Uh, you have a couple churches that are right there within the vicinity of the area, but largely it's uh, open space yeah. that didn't have a lot of housing, um, had some of those situations where you have whole blocks where there's nothing on those blocks, and it, it was an actual targeted area for dumpers. Uh, so there was... There because was, it was... Yeah, so it was empty. over 70 tons of trash that was actually that picked up during really. this, this effort. 300 tires? Yeah. And so now, now that you've got it cleared, what's the, I mean, is, like I said, over in Eastern Market, it's really easy now, I think, to imagine, well, this could be X or this could be Y. Yeah. Uh, what are you seeing in terms of the potential for that, that space in Brightmore? So we're in the midst of our uh, planning process. We're working with Community Development Advocates of Detroit, Data Driven Detroit, community residents, uh, to actually come up with a comprehensive plan for how to use land space in the neighborhood and how to use the DFC plan and all the typologies from the CDAD strategic framework process to allow to empower residents to actually pick what they would like to see next. We hope that the quality of life recommendations plus the actual physical map of the recommendations from the community would be um, used as decision making tool for city leaders going forward. Uh, at, from a neighborhood level though, uh, we were just uh, awarded the Knights Art Challenge right, um, right. to do art in open spaces, to remove, to, to change places that are blighted and, and replace it with art. Sure. That's one of the things that we'll, we'll, we'll definitely be doing in some of these open spaces. Mitch Album's crew came out a few, few weeks ago and um, did start putting down the wildflowers. So we envision everything from um, art to landscape with different types of vegetation and maybe sheep. Yeah, <laughs> sheep, I know. Everyone's talking about the sheep. Right. I would rather have sheep than goats. That's my thing. Someone said that they might bring goats. I don't, I don't think we need goats in the city. Goats are dirty. Yeah. Um, uh, so what's the next step for this Blight Authority? I mean, so now you've got two demonstration areas where it, it, it clearly has worked and uh, uh, approached the problem from a, from a different uh, vantage yeah. point. So the, the next step for us, well, first of all, we're extremely encouraged with the, the, the side effects of total blight elimination. Um, both from the jobs we created, but also the effect on the neighborhood, as Kurt talked about. But everything from crime, I mean, Andrew Arena, the Detroit Crime Commission, basically said crime was eliminated right. in the Eastern Market test pilot. Right, because there's nowhere to, to sort of hide and, and do stuff. Exactly. Right. So with, with the cooperation of momentum we have in Brightmore, we want to stay in Brightmore and expand that zone. And so we're working with the community leaders and the city and expanding that. That zone. So in a couple of weeks, we should be starting that. Is this something, though, that that uh, with the right leadership in City Hall, that we could uh, that we could say we're going to go to every area like this in the city and 
and and figure out we're building a process that can be duplicated across the city and across the country okay um, it's basically an assembly line process for for blight elimination it's not just demolition demolition if you drive down these streets and you see that there's you know over the, the hundred blocks there's there's 71 vacant structures if we just took those out the area would still You'd be still blighted. have right and right. so we view it as is structural which is the houses and non-structural, which is everything else. Right. And you can't have total blight elimination if you address one of the issues. And if you don't have total blight elimination, you're not going to move the needle on these neighborhoods. Right. Uh, the, the money that uh, that that's coming to Detroit for for demolition uh, I, I would go a lot further, right? Yes. If if we used it on this kind of process rather than just going and knocking down a house. One thing we talk about internally, and I guess now externally, if I say it here, is that <laughs> it's it's not a the money is an important aspect of it. It's about the strategy you're using to spend the money and the right. management of that money. Right, right. Uh, Kirk, you know, uh, Brightmore is the kind of place, if you look at, uh, like, the Detroit City uh, Future City Plan um, uh, or, or talk to city officials, I mean, it's sort of a question mark uh, in terms of what its future would be because it's had, you know, tremendous population loss and uh, it has economic struggles. This seems to argue that, that uh, and I think there are lots of examples of this, that even with its problems, Brightmore is the kind of place where people are fighting really hard to try to make it a better place for them, and they don't want to leave. Right. Uh, they want to build a Brightmore that, uh, that'll be there in the future. Yeah, I think that question mark is turning into an exclamation. Yeah. <laughs> <pretty quickly. laughs> uh, Brightmore is getting a lot of attention for some of the things that uh, we've been able to step out and just try. It's really uh, fertile ground right now in Detroit. If um, you have the capacity and you have some support yeah. to try something new, um, it gets a lot of attention. But it also um, serves as an example for others all over the city on what we can do to transform um, our, our landscape uh, right. going forward. Right. Uh, so what do you need? I mean, uh, what do you need from the city uh, you guys did this on your own. This is not a, a, a city program. What, what kind of things do you need them to do to help you with stuff like this? Sure. So the city's going so through so much change right now, right? Um, it's almost it's almost hard to kind of say what we would like to what where we would like to partner with the city. Yeah. Once a new administration goes in, we know that that's going to clear a lot of things up, yes. and we'll know where we can make some some actual connections with the city government, state. Yeah and federal government actually have to play a part in this if we're going to do this right in Detroit, though. Um, but the first thing we need to address are the ownership challenges. Uh, sure. Um, so the, any way the city government, state government, and some of the other untapped, unused tools through policies that are kind of like in some of our legislation that we can put on the table and have like a really open to trying something new, yeah. group of people right. would be there to kind of like try to do th different things to get to, to overcome some of these long-standing challenges right. of you know piecing together land, finding ownership, you know holding people accountable. That's the biggest thing we need to happen right now. Yeah. Um, otherwise, we're, we're getting the work done. Yeah, right? we're, we're we're constantly acting. We don't want to be sitting around planning and, right. and planning and, right. and thinking and thinking and, and planning and, and so one thing we've seen that that is very true is that blight is caused by bureaucracy. Right. The thirty six the thirty six <laughs> steps to, to to tear down a vacant structure. Yeah. I mean, come on. This is Detroit, right? right? We, put we the world should on, be able to move yeah. that along. We're the arsenal of democracy, right. and we right. can't tear down a, bla <laughs> a vacant structure. Yeah. We're better than that. Yeah. Okay, guys, great project, uh, great to have you here. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Steve. Just ahead on American Black Journal, African-American leaders in Detroit and across the country head back to school to share their personal stories and inspire students. That's coming up next. African-American leaders across the country went back to school on Friday to present real-life history lessons and to motivate students to stay in school. Nearly 500 black history makers representing a variety of fields visited schools to share stories about the struggles they encountered on their path to success. This annual event is sponsored by the History Makers, which is the nation's largest African-American oral history video archive. Joining me now are two participants here in Detroit, singer, songwriter, and actor Josh White, Jr., 
and Professor Billy Joe Evans, who's a chemist and emeritus chemistry professor at the University of Michigan. Welcome to American Black Journal. Thank you. Thank you. So actually, that doesn't sound like a lot of fun to me, going back to school. I didn't like school, <laughs> <laughs> so you couldn't have convinced me to go back and, uh, and spend a day there. Uh, I'm actually just joking, but I, the, what, what a great idea to go try to share with kids now what what you without, what you experienced? Doubt, you, left, you know, I just tell them about how my life started, and um, starting with my, I started singing with my father when I was four years old, uh -huh. and I've never done anything else. Started acting when I was nine, and um, just to to show them how my life went, my very first gig as a solo performer was here in Detroit in uh -huh. 1961, and it was interesting because June of 1961. I, I, it was, the place was not too far from Baker's Keyboard Lounge, off of okay. 8 Mile. Yeah. That's, I could not find a hotel or motel that would take me. Mm -hmm. I had to rent Is that a right? room from a black family. Really? In June of 61, when I first started as a solo performer. Wow. Here in Michigan. In Detroit. Here in Michigan. Right. Yes, here in Detroit. Right. And, and I would imagine that those kind of stories that if you tell kids now, I mean, kids now couldn't imagine, of course. Could not imagine. Anything like that. Uh, and so maybe it helps them see that mm -hmm. the obstacles that they have are not. Exactly, not that so, we have, exactly. So un unusual. Exactly. There's another side to it. Uh, I think, first of all, it's a tremendous ar archive. But more importantly, uh, the history makers is bringing it to the students. Right. Uh, not, uh, not let them passively experience it, but taking us and putting them in the classroom Exactly. And one of the things that I mentioned to my group was that uh, we know about the family situations, but my mother died when I was 16 years of age, and I was the second oldest of, of eight children. Uh -huh. and so there was a real decision I had to make. Do I go on to school or do I try to help my other brothers and sisters? Sure. My mother was quite clear that I should go to school, and I pointed that out to the students that I don't know many of them are facing issues of a similar nature. Absolutely. And what is most important for them is to continue to do well and to continue their education. Right. Exactly. Right. And I mean, that that's the point that uh, anything that you have can be taken away from you, but they yeah. can take your education. Your education, right. Can't what you know. Away, and with that which you know, if everything is taken away, you can again retrieve it because of your education. Right. Right. What was, uh, you, you grew up here in... No, I'm born and raised in New York City. You're from New York, that's right. Born and raised uh, in New York City. So when you come to, to places like Detroit, though, and see, and like you said, you came here in 1961, couldn't find a hotel. It was a very different city back then, though. A lot more people, a lot more vibrant. What, what, what can you sort of tell the kids now who are growing up in a pretty tough time in Detroit's history about sort of where you're from and how you got where you are. Well, the point was that that I was fortunate to find my passion early. Uh -huh. And the point is, find your passion. It may not be what your mom or dad wants you to do. <laughs> right. But if that's your passion and it's not hurting anyone, right. go for it. Go for it. Go for it. No matter if, if, if you're black, you want to sing country. It doesn't <laughs> matter. Just put yourself into it and do it well. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, tell me a little about your, your career. Oh, well, I'm four years old and singing with my father in New York City. Uh, uh, back during World War II, vinyl was not being used for records because of the war. Right. But what they would do, what they'd make records to send to our, our people overseas. To the troops. To the sure. troops. So my first recording, I was three and a half, singing with my father with a song that was sent overseas. And um, it's a very natural thing when you're with the one that you love, that your guardian. <laughs> and if you normally sing anyway, right? It didn't matter if you're singing in front of you guys or a thousand people <laughs> out there because I was. You're, that's what and, you were used to doing. And I found that it was my passion. Yeah. And uh, I I would not do anything else. I began performing on this on Broadway with my father. They did a play, and he was starring in it, and they needed somebody to play his son. <laughs> Perfect, uh, right. You know what I'm saying? Typecast, so I did, I did right? I four plays, and, and we were talking earlier. What I've been doing here lately in Michigan was, are you aware of the Maxi Boyce facility? Oh, sure, yeah. Which is a place for incarcerated young men. Right. But my buddy and I, Mike Ball and I, and a friend, went there and started doing root music with them. Oh, and one of right? the nicest things that's happened to me is that they all have journals. 
So we said, give us some of your journals and we'll put music to them. Oh, wow. So I get a chance to sing their songs around the country, yeah. letting people know they came from an incarcerated situation, but they're not incarcerated here. Right. They're not thinking of wanting to rob you. Right. Here's what they're thinking of, and I'll do these songs to show them where their mindset yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you're a chemist. My, 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 my uh, path is maybe a little bit different, but <laughs> what I did tell the students this morning is that the most important aspect of my development was the role of my teachers and my parents permitting my teachers to have that, that, <laughs> that role. Have that role. <laughs> so I, I didn't finish high school. Okay. Uh, and the, the main reason is that my sociology teacher saw me sitting in class one day and they were given an exam for students to go off to college without finishing high school. He said, Billy, uh, Mr. Evans, why are you not taking this exam? I said, well, my parents didn't have the money. But she didn't say, well, that's your parents' responsibility. No, she took me by the arm down to this auditorium to take the exam. She paid the $3. I took the exam. And I was the first uh, uh, student from my school to go off to college without graduating. Without graduating. <laughs> right. So, wow. I, so I went to Morehouse. What, what school was that? That was uh, it, the, the high school. It was uh -huh. Ballard Hudson High School. Okay. The biggest, one of the biggest high schools in Georgia at that time. Okay. Uh, of course, it was segregated. Um, and that wasn't all bad. I had teachers who believed in me. Sure. There was never any doubt about whether they did or not. Right. Uh, Which is were, what matters, right? Right. And they right. were very well trained because of segregation. We had excellent mm. teachers. Right. Mm. Um, so I went off to Morehouse and ran into another uh, very strong influence, uh, Henry C. McBay, who taught me chemistry. I, it was my idea to go back to Macon and teach high school and send my brothers and sisters off to school. But if you go to Morehouse and you do well, you will not do that. <laughs> <laughs> so without any planning on my part, I found myself in, in graduate school at the University of Chicago. Okay. And speaking of segregation and some of the bad things and some of the good things, uh, we blacks in Georgia were paid to not go to the Georgia universities. So the state of Georgia paid the difference between tuition at the University of Chicago and tuition at and the, the University of Georgia. Georgia really. Well, Chicago was not a cheap That's school. That's not right. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and we got those checks every quarter. Is that right? Yeah. So, wow. they, were so, about, so, they, so the state was paying you so that, to not go to... But uh, I, I couldn't go, but right. they had to give me equal access. Right. And I so see. What they, how they compensated was right. to pay the difference in tuition. Right. Wow. So that was quite a, yeah. a boon. Yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't have gone to the University of Georgia anyway. Right. <laughs> <laughs> University so of Chicago is a better get, school, to, right? To get, to get paid to do what one wants to right, do. Right. You hear that a lot, but I think this is one case in which it was true. So so when you tell uh, young people now that story, what, what what what's their reaction? I but they can't relate very well yeah. to the to that segregation aspect but i do emphasize they are going to the best school that right. they can right and as you all aware that's a major challenge in higher education now with sure. kids from lower socioeconomic levels who are high achieving yes. going to non-selective schools right Right, and so that's that's a real hurdle yeah. to get these kids to begin to think about going to the very best to very schools. competitive schools exactly. like the right. University of Michigan. Right, 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 right. And so we're working on that at Michigan. Right, uh, we have something called the Wolverine Express that sort of does what the History Makers uh, does, but uh, just on a state right. Uh, right. level. Yeah, uh, we, we've got about two minutes uh, left. I, I'm curious. I ask everybody who talks with young people now, what are you seeing with young people in our in our community in terms of their hope, in terms of, this is a tough time in Detroit, it's a very tough time to be a young person. What, what are the things you're seeing that make, that maybe give you uh, optimism or hope about, about them? Well, they listen, you know, and the important thing to get to somebody, you gotta get their attention, have them listen. Have them focus. Have yeah. them focus, have them listen, and sometimes y you may walk away and feel that maybe they didn't grasp it, but yeah. you know, time does a lot but of But they do, yeah. The same, my group was very attentive. Yeah. 
Uh, and you have to get their attention. <laughs> and so what I did Competing with was, the television to, and video was games to reenact a role I played in a play in the fifth grade. Yeah. Well, I was a grumble. There they were go. very quiet, <laughs> but they were very attentive. Yeah. Uh, uh, very my, my wife was with me. We both remarked that if you, if you put yourself out, they if you engage them, they right. will respond. Exactly. Okay. exactly. Great. Yeah. Great program, guys. Thank you for, very much for being here. Thanks Thank for having you. us. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. We'd love to hear what you thought about today's program and get your ideas for future shows. So connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time on American Black Journal. What does DTE Energy do to make Michigan a better place? Rodney can tell you. We do a lot, like youth education and employment programs. We fund over 500 jobs for youth all across the state. Many are neighborhood improvement projects just like this. It's incredible. Wow, that is fantastic. So this is like a paint by number, this whole thing, right? Communities are such great places, aren't they? They sure are. I love the siding. Measure once, cut twice, right? DTE Energy, know your own power. When I grow up, when I grow up, when I grow up, I want to be an architectural engineer. A registered nurse. In the law enforcement. A computer scientist. A successful person. Give Michigan's children the chance to aim high with quality early education.